Yo, welcome back to The Pulse here on the Joy News channel on Your Motor TV. Now, the Inspector General of Police is proposing what many will kick against. He's asking that social media in Ghana be shut down on election day. Why is the guarantee peace on November 7? This comes as the security agencies have been explaining what measures they will be enforcing ahead of the 2016 presidential and parliamentary elections. Join us is Joseph Opokugako, who is with our security desk, joins me now in the studio with details of this very interesting story that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Uh, Joseph, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon mm -hmm. to you, Francis. Um, what inspired this comment by the IGP that he's looking at us, what, blacking out social media on election day? Well, it's been a general conversation he's been having with uh, some media persons today about the plans for ensuring adequate security ahead of the elections. And he made the point that, looking at the fact that the social media has been used to spread information that is not exactly accurate and that it's raised tension in the country and all of that, one of the things that the police administration is considering on election day would be to black out social media and not allow people to have access to it and make use of it on the day. And he thinks that that may help guarantee the peace of the nation going into the 2016 elections. He explained that it's one of several options that they are considering. They are also considering other things, including reactivating their own social media accounts so that when people put out information that is false, then they'll make use of that platform to actually counter uh, you know, the false information. Because, in fact, the, the, the whole conversation about this started from concerns that came up earlier in the media interaction that beyond what the police would be doing and all of that, it, you know, if, if, first of all, mainstream media does not play its role adequately to help ensure that inciting words are not put out on the platform, the radio and TV platforms and all of that, then all that the police will, you know, will be doing on election day and even after that would actually come to a notch. And then the conversation veered in social media. In fact, th there was a specific question from one of the participants about what they intend doing about the information that comes out through social media beyond what comes out through mainstream media. And he made the point that, well, the, the option of blacking out social media is a proposal, but they're also considering other things as well. Their okay. own platform. Joseph, let's, let's hear from the IGP when he responded to that question uh, put to him generally during this media interaction. And then we'll look at the other strands of what Joseph sought to uh, get from the IGP in trying to understand why this proposal should even be considered in the first place. Yeah. As other countries have done. So we are thinking about it. And also, the other alternative that uh, was also the police will. Also, the IT uh, compliance by trying to you know, get this uh, our whole social media to counter this on time. Mm -hmm. So, we are looking at the variables of where. I can't do the shall come out of a decision. Thank you. Let me also add. Right, so uh, Joseph, what was the reaction of? the Ghana Journalist Association president of money to this proposal? Well, it, it wasn't just about his reaction. Even the, the media team that were present were not exactly excited about this comment by the IGP. Uh, our own Manasa Ajurawene was present there. Uh, he, he made an intervention. In fact, he made an appeal to the IGP that he thinks that they should drop this suggestion altogether because the thinking is that the media persons make use of some of these social media platforms to spread their own information and get access to information. And mm -hmm. Manasi actually pointed out to the IGP that when things are done in the open and issues are circulated on social media, it becomes difficult for someone to lie or, or put out wrong information about maybe election results because it, it, apart from the issue official declaring it there, you know, people will not have the, the sole right to share the information. It would be all over social media. Uh, the, well, the IGP exactly didn't respond to that when Manasseh made the suggestion. But the DJ president, Safa Moni, also mounted the podium, getting to the end of the media interaction, and he kicked against this completely. He asked the IGP to consider dropping the idea altogether. Okay, let's hear from him then. The IGP, in his earlier submission, takes some boxes of issues on the ownership structure of the media, and of course, the intention to, to deal a surgical blow to social media. On social media, we we'll humbly appeal to him not to go there. <laughs> because social media are the cousins of the traditional media, so that we allow them for, for pecs and for tips to do our stories. So we we'll beg him to not even contemplate banning social media. But his aspect can do something to at least regulate, which is impossible, attempt to regulate socially determined content. 
So the media is apprehensive about this proposal by the IGP, but did the IGP backtrack on this? No, he's actually defending the suggestion. So as we walked out of the premises, I got an interview with him and he insists that this has been done in other African countries and that it's worked for them. And so for him, you know, doing this would not amount to being undemocratic or anything of that sort. He thinks that the security of the country is the most important thing that should be considered going into the 2016 elections. And so uh, the, the whole idea that such a move would be undemocratic, it's, it, it won't paint a good image of an advancing society and even a modern society, he, he, he disagrees completely. He stands by the suggestion, except that he says that it's a decision that will be taken going into the 2016 elections. All right. Let's hear from him then. Uh, what I'll be saying is that uh, we are going to consider a series of alternatives for the D-Day, the day of the voting. And we're looking at what the terrain will be if it demands that that day there should not be anything that has been done in other areas where it has been successful. Why not? Wouldn't that be an infringement on our right to free speech, our right to free expression, and even modernity in general? I, I, I think uh, it will be so. What has been tried in other economies? I mean, the main is the security of this. Some country. say this happened only in Iran and Syria, and also when. No, there have been other African countries have tried it. When well, leaders are not democratic enough. No, I don't think so. The security of every nation is paramount to every other thing. And there are so if, 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 the, if the person, now I'm saying that if during or before we find that the escape is convenient, why not? We, we, we still go ahead. We've not tried it. But if people are churning out the type of uh, things and this uh, information that we are having on the media, which are quite false, and we feel that it can cite, why not? The skill of this nation is paramount to every other thing. So saying that is this, I don't see another here or there. It's for even less than 24 hours. Well, let's just start from 7 uh, to 5 o'clock. And that is one of the alternatives, as my uh, uh, PRO said. We are also looking at others where we can meet those who are going to do for good for good by rich, activating our social media uh, system, which has gone very bad for some time now. I have a funny feeling we've not had the last of this particular suggestion uh, being given by the IGP for us to shut down social media on election day. I know you have thoughts to share on this particular issue. Drop them on our social media platforms, Facebook, Join News, Twitter, at Join News on TV with the hashtag The Pulse. Drop us your thoughts on what you make of the IGP's proposal that we should be considering shutting down social media on election day. Send us your thoughts uh, right now. But we know that th this was not the only thing that's cast when the media interacted with the police today. Uh, Joseph, walk us through the other issues that came up today, what, what they seek to do as we draw closer and closer to the elections. He spoke about general preparation security-wise ahead of the elections. He mentions, for example, that they've been doing what they call an auditing of various parts of the country ahead of the 2016 elections, and that auditing has allowed them to identify a number of hotspots going into the elections where they'll be paying keen attention to on election day, even before and after that. He's also been commenting on... Okay, but hold on. If, if he says we have flashpoints, did, did he mention some of them that we should be looking out for? No, he, he, he makes the point that they, the police, they've identified them, and so the assurance is that they would be working on them and, and make sure that uh, on the day they are well protected. Uh, he, he, go, he went on to talk about some training programs that have been ongoing. He says that the police and other security agencies personnel they are being trained ahead of the elections so they understand the process they know what to do on the election day and so that has also started giving the indication that the necessary preparations are ongoing he says that they've started mobilizing resources and equipment ahead of elections and all of that all of that are in place uh, he's also been commenting on the role that he thinks the media should play, the, the, the mainstream media, they're asking for the support of the media going into... What should the, we do? Well, they, they think that the media should avoid allowing persons who would come on our platforms and make insightful comments and end up, you know, creating all sorts of controversies and heightening tension ahead of the elections. Uh, generally on security as well, the point to the media, uh, the joint news team, Martha Takrental, uh, uh, assignment editor asked the question Prince about Lacqua, yes. exactly the, the sort of protection that they'll be providing for media houses going into the 2016 elections because she made references to incidents during elections that we've seen situations of people massing up at certain media houses and threatening them beating and all of up that. journalists as well exactly and the IGP indicated that well they don't have enough men to dispatch them to every single media house across the country but the assurance is given is that even in that regard they are identifying media houses that could be potential targets for supporters on each side of the political divide going into the elections and that adequate security would be provided for them as well on election day and even after that but on the bit about um, the general preparation 
going into the 2016 elections, he's asking the members of the public to trust the police service and that they will be neutral as much as possible, uh, they, they would not be partial, and that the, well, the different parties and the public should have confidence in them that they will keep peace going into the election and even after the election. Let's hear from him then. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the security agencies on our part are leaving no stone unturned in our bid to secure the election. In this respect, the National Election Security Task Force, the body charged with the responsibility of protecting the pools, has been inaugurated far ahead of time to put measures in place to attain this objective. Other activities include the IGP's dialogue series, the media campaign, which is gradually gathering momentum, mobilization and training of personnel, mobilization of transport and logistics, and assembly of legal investigation and prosecution teams across the country. Furthermore, a detailed auditing of the entire security service according the country has been done to identify all the flashpoints and vulnerable areas and a comprehensive operational strategy mapped out to care to take care of them. In another vein, personnel for the election duties from all the security agencies have been earmarked in a series of orientation and training schedule lined up to bring them up to speed with modern models of election security which we call how to police elections. And right then, so uh, that's the IGP. Speaking about the general preparations and what we'll see them do ahead of the 2016 elections to ensure that all of us are safe before, during, and after election 2016. Joseph is still with us. It's been quite a long day for them in explaining what we should see them do in the coming days. Joseph, uh, they also speak about the thorny issue we saw some months ago, protection for flag bearers. What do they have to say about that? Yes, yeah, so they spoke about protection for flag bearers and they spoke about protection for campaigns generally because we know that campaigns are usually public events, streets are blocked and, and all of that. So they, they are assuring that they'll be providing adequate security for those. And he's been throwing out a caution to the various political parties that they expect them to abide by the public order act to the latter in the sense that because most of these campaign activities are public events, they are supposed to inform the police well ahead so that adequate preparations for protection will be made. He's, he, he's demanding that the political parties respect the, the dictates of the public order act. Uh, and he's also been commenting on that tricky issue, protection for the flag bearers. In fact, uh, he, he's been defending the, the proposal that the political parties and the flag bearers should themselves nominate police people that they would want as their security with. detail, give mm -hmm. them the names, and then they would give further training to such persons and allow them to go protect the flag bearers. The, 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 the police make the point that um, that is not the wrong thing to do. It's been done years ago ahead of elections and it's worked. They, they also make the point that what they are providing are personal bodyguards for these flag bearers. And when it comes to the choice of a bodyguard, these are personal issues and individual decisions that people take. So the example was cited that the IGP has a bodyguard. Obviously, that bodyguard is not the IGP. It's, it's not the bodyguard who guarded the previous IGP. When this IGP came in, he chose his personal bodyguard. Ministers and all of that get bodyguards, but these are individual people. They are not there to serve the position. But issues of people being bodyguard are private issues. But, that, again, but again, Joseph, much as he makes that point, the example he gives for the police hierarchy and ministers is quite different from presidential flag bearers because if they provide a list of the people that they want to work with as personal bodyguards, somebody will easily say that, okay, this police officer is an MPP police officer or a CPP police officer or an NDC uh, police officer. How do they respond to that uh, as well? In, in fact, after the interaction with the IGP, I put this question to uh, Chief Superintendent Dr. Agozo, who is actually the Director of Special Operations at the Ghana Police Service. And the, the response he gave me was that I should cite one single example for him of a police officer who is guarded a flag bearer and has subsequently been victimized or has been tagged as being part of one political party or the other. And, and, and the, the defense is that this doesn't happen. Even after they go serve those details, when it's over, they come back to the service and they continue serving. So it's it, it worked for them in the past. They are sticking by it this time around. And I asked him again, so how do they do the identification? Th these are politicians, for all you know, they don't have 
police people that they know personally to then go identify then the, 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 the response to pretend gave me was that well within these political parties they have um, retired commissioners of police and retired senior police officials who are members of the political party. I so see. the expectation is that they would help do the identification of some of And they will identify people who identify with them as former commissioners with, with, a, with a certain leaning? They, they insist that it doesn't necessarily have to be that and that what some of this commentary has done is to politicize the whole issue and mm. so they would want us to look at this in the political sense. The police persons are professionals even as they go to serve those flag bearers. There are specific indications of what they can do and what they cannot do. And these guidelines have been provided for them to strictly abide by. It's been provided for the leaders of the political parties, what these persons can get themselves involved in and what they shouldn't they get themselves get, okay, involved in. So fine. they would remain neutral going into the entire right. exercise. Interesting. Interesting details he gives for that flag bearer discussion and the kind of bodyguards that were provided for them. But we also know that, that the military showed up at this event, didn't Yes, the director, uh, not the director, but a representative from the chief of defense staff was present at this interaction, Brigadier. General Michael Adetti, and um, he, he gave the assurance that they'll be providing the necessary backup to ensure that the election goes on smoothly. In fact, uh, th there was a question about the role that the military will be playing compared to the role, the, the role that the police will be playing, because there was this concern that there was an incident in Pram Pram during the NDC primaries. And in, in the course of that, there were some disagreements. The military had moved in. The police commander there then, uh, Madame Beatrice Anziri, uh, ordered the military to withdraw. They refused to withdraw. It resulted in some sort of chaos between mm -hmm. the, the military and the police. So there was a specific question about the role that the military will play and the role that the police will play. Uh, the, the, the military commander present explained that they are providing only a backup role, but they've set out in very minute details which is an operational plan they have on paper, you know, the different roles of the different sides, and that the military would only move in to support the sister security agencies as a second or third layer, not as the first batch. And so they would be doing the best that they can to ensure adequate communication so that the chaos that we saw, like what happened in Nego Pram Pram during the NDC primaries, do not return again. Okay, we can hear from the brigadier then. Honestly, we have had a couple of several engagements, both at operational and tactical levels in order to streamline, like you said, standard operational procedures and rules of engagement. The, 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 the ABCD of what we do as professionals, as police and uh, soldiers is based upon standard operational procedures and rules of engagement. But to err is human. Sometimes a uh, few things go wrong. Sometimes a few things go wrong. We acknowledge that. And, and, and as history has it, the things that go wrong are the, the, uh, uh, the foundations upon which we are able to perfect our acts. So as we move forward, uh, I can assure Gabi and Adakabre that with all the limitations of men, material, resources, we are a third world. We need to all acknowledge that we are a third world country. And, and even in America, and I didn't believe that if in America phone calls can go bust. You are making a, call, a phone call in America and they say it, it cuts. Uh, so I asked myself, uh, is it, is it, we're we going to make so much noise about it. What I'm saying is that your police, your army, with all the imperfections or the, 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 the limitations of, that we have, we're moving forward systematically and we need each one of you, particularly the press men to come on board to help us to do the things that we ought to do and do them right. It's, we are not here to discuss operational and tactical issues, but I can, like the IGP has said, all through the trail, all along the line, down to the, the minutest uh, uh, police station, we have the procedures in place. And we pray to God that uh, each one of us will accept what we are doing in very good faith, trusting the judgment and professionalism of each one of your brothers and sisters. Everybody here is part of the call to duty that we ought to display in order to make sure that we do our work professionally to the best of our abilities. So that's for the military and the explanation they give of what their role will be in this year's elections. More has been discussed at the media interaction today with the Ghana Police Service. Joseph is still with me in the studio. Joseph, one more thing we need to talk about just before you go. That matter of arms proliferation in the country now, just a few months 
to the elections has been a major talking point. Did the police address this matter and what you're doing about it? That came up very strongly and there were reactions on that from the IGP himself who said that they are stepping up security across the borders in collaboration with the Ghana Immigration Service and so they, they are asking for support from the public by the provision of adequate information when some of these arms are spotted and all of that. There was also a reaction on, on, on that from the director general in charge of the criminal investigations department that um, COP Prosper Ablo. Uh, he, he's been disputing the, the whole impression that a lot more arms are being brought into the country this year going into the election compared to previous years. You know there's been a, a number of reports on that. There was one in Kumasi, I think, last week. Yes. Earlier, in the, earlier in the year, there was uh, an interception in Aflao. Even late last year, there was one in the Upper East. There was another, even here in Accra, which was banned for Techiman and all of that. But the point he makes is that throughout this year, uh, they've not approved or given license for anyone to import any kinds of you know, guns Assault or ammunition, ammunition mm. into the country. So. Uh, you know, legally or officially, none has been imported into the country since the beginning of the year. He makes the point that what has actually come into the country since the beginning of the year are cartridges, which are not exactly arms. So his point is that sometimes the media tend to confuse the, 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 the guns themselves, as, as in the arms, not the ammunition, but the guns themselves, and also uh, the cartridges that are brought in. Uh, he went on to make the point that... But uh, what, okay, but what are the cartridges? Okay, so the cartridges are more like the bullets. That are used. Which are arms and, are they on? Well, they are the ammunition and then they are the arms. So his clarification, the clarification he gives is that they, they've not had any um, guns coming in since mm -hmm. the beginning of the year. What they've had coming in are the cartridges, more like the bullets. Okay. He, he also went on to make the point that a lot of what we've seen in, in the country are, are also locally manufactured weapons, which he, he, he went on to state emphatically that are illegal and that no one in this country has a license to produce uh, you know, guns locally, and so they announced that they will clamp down on the, the various places where some of these things are, are actually undertaken. And Rosby Atinga has been given some of the areas where some of these, uh, you know, locally manufactured guns are actually put together, and she indicated that they are willing and ready to clamp down on them. Uh, Rosby Atinga is actually the director general in charge of administration at the Ghana Police Service. Election Task Force, which is not made up of politicians. It's made up of security agencies, and the head is the Inspector General of Police. And this is replicated at the regions and the districts. These committees are different from RECSEC and DICEC, so that we cannot be influenced in whatever way. Because we know that some ministers or this is might also be standing for positions. So to avoid conflict of interest, it is the police that is in charge. And we assure you that we will be professional. In addition to that, you realize that we have vigilantes or Yes, vigilantes. And the police administration has come out categorically to say that we are not going to allow them. They could come from any political party, whether the incumbent or opposition. But we are saying that we are not going to tolerate these vigilantes. So please, have confidence in us. We are impartial. We are professional. Thank you. Identify the uh, problems that can lead to chaos in our elections. We began this uh, quest by not blaming anybody. But at the end of it all, uh, the truth has come out. Some of you have uh, hit the nail right on the head that the problem sometimes comes from us. And if we desist from Inflating, inflaming passions on air, taking sides with other political parties, the end will be disastrous. Because come to think of it, in certain jurisdictions, if there are issues, they look for experts. 
maybe from the universities, technocrats, and ask of their opinion. But in our setup, if there is an issue involving one political party, the next person to ask a question from is uh, the opposition. And you know, like the, I can't say, what are you expecting? What are you soliciting from that person? It is rancor and bitterness. So along the line, we've met almost all the political parties. We've met stakeholders. And most of them also said, meet the media, because they are also part and parcel of the problem. So I am happy, and I know the IG is elated, that we have had people who are so bold, they've hit the nail on the head. So we should all desist from inflaming passions. Thank you. Thank you. Are locally manufactured weapons. They don't come from outside. That is also very frightening. You all know of uh, Alabanyo, Magazi, in Kumase, uh, Western region, Ashama. Those are our challenges because what internally is manufactured, we cannot quantify. And that is what mostly is used to commit robberies and what have you. So as media personnel, if you get wing of such uh, what is it, uh, factories, because most of them, the factories are in the bush. You let us know. Thank you. Uh, that's Rose Biatinga, the Director of Administration for the Ghana Police Service, uh, speaking on uh, a host of issues, including the uh, ammunition we've seen in the country in recent times. They say that we may see it as a lot more coming in, but if you look at their numbers, they haven't authorized any company at all to go ahead to bring in arms into the country. So the big question remains, where are these arms coming from and who is using them even in a year like this when we are preparing for the election? Joseph Upokugapu is, is with our security desk. He joins. He joined me this afternoon uh, for more on this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Joseph, Thank you. Uh, for those details. Quite a lot to digest from the security front today with the Ghana Police Service busy talking about what you're doing to protect all of us. And on that issue of the social media blackouts, many of you have been sending us your thoughts on our social media platforms. I'll read your comments uh, after the break, plus other stories about the military brutality we've seen up north. Details of that story and more after the break. Stay with us.